guys? How's it going? Mr. Strong coming back for another ODFP Showcase. And in today's showcase, we are going to be looking at Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, the last ruling German emperor slash king of Russia. And he's going to be noted for ruling Germany between the years of 1888 to 1918. He lived between the years of 1859 to 1941. And remember, the Kaiser, the last Kaiser of Germany during the Second Reich, which means empire. Now, you have to understand, when we talk about this guy behind me, you have to first understand the Germany that he was walking right into. In 1888, Wilhelm II succeeded his grandfather as Kaiser. The new emperor, the new Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, was supremely confident in his abilities and wished to put his own stamp on Germany. In 1890, he shocked Europe. He shocked Europe by asking the dominating Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor himself, to resign. And the Germany that he inherited rapidly grew into becoming industrial giants. Keep that in mind. By the time Wilhelm II became Kaiser, Germany had already developed an educated and disciplined workforce. With the creation of a growing middle class, full of professionals, Germany's economy was productive and efficient. We are going to see Germany's government and industrialists, they are going to support research and development in the universities. And by the late 1890s, Germany had also created a single currency and established a national banking system and had extensive railroad trading networks, which connected the growing and industrial cities of Germany. Now, when Wilhelm II comes to the throne, he takes the crown, he's going to bring immediate changes. You have to understand that Wilhelm seriously believed in the divine right. He believed that his right to rule, it came from God. And, not surprisingly, he resisted efforts to introduce democratic reforms. His government policies did provide social welfare or programs instituted to help certain groups of people. And his government also provided services such as cheap transportation and electricity. He is also noted for uh, improving the excellent system of public schools which had flourished under Bismarck. And in these schools, he's going to teach students obedience to himself, all right? He is going to teach students to be obedient to the Kaiser as well as help them learn a thing or two about reading, writing, and mathematics, because that, that's kind of important too. Now, similar to his grandfather, Kaiser Wilhelm II, he lavished funds on the German military machine, which was already the most powerful in continental Europe. He also launched an ambitious campaign to expand the German Navy and win an overseas empire to rival those of both Britain and France. And this is going to contribute to an aggressive nationalism and militaristic stance, which will only increase tension so, excuse me, prior to World War I. Now, you have to understand, during the reign of Kaiser Wilhelm, you have to understand that nationalism, that pride that people have for their one country, all right, is really going to be growing and festering throughout much of Europe. All right, nationalism impacted international relations in Germany with other European countries slash kingdoms. And by 1914, Europe was enjoying, actually, a period of relative peace. A lot of idealists hoped for a permanent end to the scourge of war. However, not everyone was so hopeful. In fact, Otto von Bismarck was quoted as stating, and quote, I shall not live to see the Great War, but you will see it and it will start in the East, end quote. Many people in Europe were beginning to draw lines, guys, and groups of ethnicities were beginning to guard their statuses. And in the East, we're going to see two old empires begin to crumble in Austria-Hungary, as well as the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Now, the reason why they're going to be crumbling is because of nationalism. You're going to have groups in each of these countries vying for their own sovereign nation state. And competition is going to help fuel what was going on here in Europe. Competition brought about the age of new imperialism and pitted Germany with the rest of the rapidly growing and industrial countries of Europe. With this competition, guys, we are going to see new rivalries begin to exist even amongst family members themselves, and therefore create, well, you called it, 
a family feud. Come on down, all right? In fact, Kaiser Wilhelm, this is important, Kaiser Wilhelm II was actually cousins with King George V. They were cousins and they were the grandchildren of Queen Victoria of England who had died in 1901. Also, remember, Tsar Nicholas II, the absolute ruler of Russia, was actually a cousin by marriage. And despite all this, aggressive nationalism still continued, continued to ensue throughout much of Europe and played a major role in the outbreak of World War I. As a result of all this, Germany, during the time of Bismarck, decided to sign treaties and create alliances in case neighboring countries like France would ever think to attack Germany to avenge its lost land from the Franco-Prussian War. And one of those alliances that are going to be made during the time of Bismarck is the Triple Alliance. Eventually, the Triple Alliance was formed in 1882, before the rise of Kaiser Wilhelm II. Between the countries that were involved here were Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And in 1914, when the actual war broke out, I'm talking about World War I, the Great War itself, Germany and Austria, Hungary, they fought on the same side and became known as the Central Powers. Later on throughout the war, we are also going to see Bulgaria and the Ottoman Emperor join Germany and Austria, Hungary. Now, what you got to know is that during this time, during the reign of Kaiser, we are going to see him desire his desire really play a role here for respect. He's gonna really push to gain respect all throughout Europe. Wilhelm II, keep in mind, he was a very self-centered person and believed that Europe had not taken enough notice of what he was doing in Germany. In fact, he was actually quoted as stating, my colleagues, the monarchs of Europe have paid no attention to what I say. Oh, the poor Kaiser. As Kaiser, he fought to win respect for himself and his empire, and he did this by increasing Germany's military size and might by focusing on building up of arms and making German society more militaristic, a certain glorification of the military through the use of propaganda posters like the one you see right behind me. Now, due to all this, Kaiser and the rest of Germany were looking for a fight. They became ready for a fight to break out, to show to the world just how far they would come from the fragmented status that was seen after the uh, Congress of Vienna in 1815. Now, Germany will eventually become involved in World War I when we see the Great Crisis occur in 1914. In July 28th, 1914, we are going to see Austria-Hungary and Serbia. They are going to begin the war. All right, Austria-Hungary is going to declare war on the small state of Serbia because one of their archdukes, Franz Ferdinand, was shot and killed by a Serbian nationalist by the name of Gavrilo Princip. Now, when this happens, we are going to see these alliances get kicked into effect. All right, keep that in mind. And we are going to see multiple countries join in on this small little conflict here in the Balkan states of Europe. Now, one of those countries is going to be Germany. Germany, as stated earlier with the Triple Alliance, they joined Austria-Hungary here. And in response to this involvement of Austria-Hungary and Serbia, we are going to see the Serbians ask for aid from Russia. And Russia will join in as well. Once Russia joins in, we're actually going to see France join in and really declare war on both Germany and Austria. Germany tries to intimidate France here and tells them that they should not get involved with the war or else Germany will then exact war back on France. And it's really a domino effect. With one conflict, with one event, it'll lead to multiple conflicts and boom, we're gonna have World War I begin. Now, Germany will escalate World War I. Keep this in mind. This will be a time where the Germans escalate things with their Schlieffen plan, in which they're going to try and invade France through the north by crossing into Belgium, which was neutral. Now, this is going to tick off a lot, a lot of countries in Europe. One in particular that was very powerful was England, Belgium's neighbor to the northwest. When the Germans invade with the Schlieffen plan, into uh, Belgium and later into France, English will later get involved. They will see this as an act of war by the Germans and therefore declare war on Germany. So the Germans are often blamed for World War I, but they cannot deny the fact that they kind of escalated things here in World War I. The Schlieffen plan, uh, plan was supposed to call for a quick victory against France and then later go into Russia, it would allow the German troops to go into Russia and invade the Eastern Front. However, the Schlieffen Plan failed. It failed, keep that in mind. 
And because of this, we're gonna see a stalemate for much of World War I, where neither side is going to be gaining an edge, and Germany is gonna be fighting a two-front war, one in the West and then one in the East, against the Russians in the East and against the French and British in the West. Things will really stay the same. There really won't be an uh, advantage gained on either side throughout much of World War I until the Americans get involved in 1917. We're gonna see the Americans come in and aid the British and French, which will push the Germans back. And you have to keep in mind that when the United States of America joins the efforts here in World War I, when the Americans join the effort, that's gonna be the key moment that's gonna spell the end of the Second Reich for Germany, okay? As well as Kaiser Wilhelm II. Eventually, Germany is gonna run out of resources. They're gonna lose manpower, and as a result, they will surrender in 1918. When they surrender, Kaiser Wilhelm is actually going to flee Germany and enter the Netherlands and actually live there for the rest of his life until his death in 1941. Now, in order to understand Kaiser Wilhelm, let's revisit his final legacy. Keep in mind that Kaiser Wilhelm II was around during the height of the Second Reich. He took the baton from Otto von Bismarck and ran with it even more. And he helped build Germany into the imperial empire that it became. But he was also there when it came crumbling down towards the end of World War I. His aggressive stance on nationalism and militarism is ultimately what helped him build his empire, but also what helped in hurting his empire. Keep that in mind for Kaiser Wilhelm II. All right, that's all I got for this OTFP showcase. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Mr. Rollins, signing off. I'll see you guys later.